Our second reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter. You can find that on page 1078 or 1637 in your pew Bibles. Uh, Very much uh, similar to the passage, the Gospel reading that was read last week during Celebrate the Gifts of Women, uh, but from a different Gospel and with a different spin for sure, different emphasis, and then... Some of the things that are probably most important are not even really what I want to spend most of the time, our time on together today. So, a story about Jesus in the home of friends, John chapter 12, the first 11 verses. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is one of the strangest dinner parties ever. You may have gone to an unusual dinner party or two or three yourself, but it doesn't come close to comparing to this. Many things about it seem about normal. This is Jesus with his disciples, the normal group that's with him. He's in the home of friends. So far, relatively usual. Um, It's a dinner given in Jesus' honor. That's not surprising at all. So, usual suspects at one of their favorite places. Everyone's honoring Jesus. We'll talk about why in a moment. And then, in the midst of this, what seems like it almost could have been a regular dinner party, it was not regular at all, strange things start happening. Martha is serving, because that's what Martha not only likes to do, but also thinks she's supposed to do. Mary is not helping her sister Martha serve, but rather is at table with everybody else, which we already know has been the source of an argument between the two sisters a while before. Lord, don't you see I'm doing all this? I'm I'm going to all this trouble. And Mary's sitting there listening to you like a regular disciple. But Mary once again does something even more unusual than taking the place of a disciple at Jesus' feet. She goes to his feet, literally, and she takes about a pint of really expensive, really fragrant perfume and pours it on his feet and then wipes his feet with her hair. And the part of the story that might really thrill you and makes me filled with dread is, and the whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. And I'm thinking you wouldn't taste anything else for the rest of the meal. You wouldn't smell anything else for the rest of the meal. Do you know there are some choirs that will prohibit any cologne or perfume among the choir members because some of us react to that really strongly and suddenly we can't sing? It filled the house, the whole house with an enormous... I mean, and I, I, am, I am prone to occasionally criticize in my mind... Um, it seems to be affliction, an affliction among young men, particularly when they first start using cologne, not really to understand. <laughs> Certain sayings come from a place of truth. A little goes a long way, absolutely true. Not just young men, the principal of my, principal of my high school also, you could smell him coming around the corner. His cologne came into the room before he did. The whole house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume that just a little bit and you go, oh, that's lovely, that's wonderful. And Mary, who has now wiped Jesus' feet with her hair, oh, for, I don't know, a week, two, three weeks, everywhere she goes, people are going to be turning and looking at the fragrance that's going by. She empties a pint of perfume on Jesus' feet and it filled the whole house. That is a strange thing. Judas 
says, this is worth a whole year's wages. So, you know, it was really, it was the good stuff. And all of it just dumped out on Jesus' feet. And G- Judas says, well, wait a minute. We could have used that money to help the poor. And very few of the disciples are fooled by this. I don't know when they found out that Judas was a thief as well as the one who would later betray Jesus, but they had their questions. They had their suspicions about how much went into the money bag and how much was there when it came time to buy food. But Judas is thinking, this is payday. It is worth so much money that they'll never, ever look for how much I'm going to skim off the top here. He doesn't care two wits about the poor. This could have been given to the poor. Judas would never give any money to the poor unless Jesus made him. That's a strange thing too. And then Jesus, the guest of honor at this dinner, starts saying strange things as well. Leave her alone. It was intended she should save this for the day of my burial. Jesus is 33 years old. What do you mean for the day of my burial? And if she was saving it, why has she poured it out all over you now? Why does Jesus keep saying these really discouraging things about suffering and dying and something about being raised again from the dead? You will always have the poor among you. You will not always have me. Well, now you know at dinner parties, you're not supposed to talk about religion or politics or money, but you're certainly not supposed to talk about dying a lot. And Jesus is kind of on a kick here where he keeps talking about dying. You will not always have me. And none of those things is the strangest part of this dinner party, this strange, strange, unusual dinner party. The strangest thing of all is that Lazarus is at the table reclining with Jesus and his disciples. Lazarus, in the words of uh, somebody I'm going to quote a lot this morning, the newly undead. Lazarus, who was dead last chapter. Lazarus, who was raised from the dead. More than that, Jesus goes to the tomb and says, roll away the stone. And the sister, the practical sister, Martha says, but Lord... I don't think that's such a good idea. He's been in there for a few days. And as one person says, I didn't look it up. I so wish I'd looked it up. But as one person wrote, the King James says, he stinketh. He stinketh. Lord, there's a bad odor. It's been four days since he's been in there. Lazarus is at the dinner table in his house with his sisters and his friend Jesus and all of Jesus' disciples. And that is the strangest thing of all. This is a weird dinner party. Lazarus was dead. Now he's alive. And, of course, all those questions we don't have time to answer or even to look into. How is Lazarus feeling about this? Well, feeling much better, thank you, than when I was dead. But no, really, what's going to happen now, Lazarus? Do you get to live forever, having died once and been raised again four days later? No. Lazarus is going to die again. That's not so good. Death is all around this story, all around this dinner party. This is the strangest thing. And to make it even stranger, and it's not all my idea. I've got some really good ideas from a couple of other people. But this little gathering together, where did the food come from? Oh, well, that's easy, right? They're wealthy. They bought food. But no, really, where did the food come from? Because Lazarus was dead in the last chapter, and a lot of people were at the house with Mary and Martha. And what do you do when someone has died, right? You flood the house with food, not just Presbyterians. I know you think it's just us. It's really not just us. Methodists do this too. Baptists do this too. Episcopalians sometimes, not not in every case. They they have people who do that. They have people who will give the food uh, to the people, but not everybody. But I'm wondering about this meal, I'm wondering if this is the food that is flooded in for Mary and Martha on the occasion of their brother's death. And now their brother's alive and Jesus is still here with his disciples and we need to feed them something. And this feels a lot to me like a reception after a funeral, except the deceased is not deceased any longer. He's there at the table too. That's just strange. That is so weird. I remember the first funeral I went to, it was for my grandfather who lived up in North Arkansas. The first funeral I went to where I realized that food might be part of a funeral, it hadn't occurred to me before. But we'd gone two hours away to where my grandparents lived and we were at the church and we were about to go to the cemetery. And I remember one of the ladies of the church coming up to my father, this is the church that he grew up in, and saying, when you get through with the cemetery, come back and we'll have lunch ready for you. And I thought, why would you have lunch ready for us? It hadn't occurred to me. I was young at the time. Didn't know that we were going to have it. And it sounded kind of like it was going to be, oh, it's lunch. It's a reception. It's going to be the. And I, this doesn't seem quite right because my grandfather has died and we're going to go to the cemetery. And now we're going to come back and have a great big dinner. 
And these dinners can be strange, right? Receptions after funerals, there is a mixture of feelings. There is sadness and there is joy. You're often with people you don't get the chance to see very much. Sometimes you're with family members that you don't hang out with much at all. Cousins are running around after the service, after the cemetery. But when it's lunchtime, young cousins might be running together, grandchildren running around, enjoying each other's company. And yet you're there because of the funeral. I remember that struck me as strange that first time. But I was just at a funeral reception that was a lot like that. On Wednesday, I asked for prayer last week for my friend Dwight. I told you he's been on hospice for years. Uh, He'd taken a turn for the worse. He was 54 years old. He died that afternoon, Sunday afternoon. He did get to see his son's confirmation. Uh, The church filmed it, live streamed it on video, and so they were able to, uh, through the computer, watch the confirmation service. And then when the family came home after the service, Dwight died shortly thereafter. And that was just one in a list, right? We have been marking a number of people's deaths, a number of services. There's this woman who works at the national offices in Louisville of of our denomination, the PCUSA, and she has an interesting job. One of her jobs is um, each week to look at what the scripture lessons are going to be for the following week. I don't know if she just does this during Lent or she does it all the time, but I get these things forwarded to me. And she basically writes about what the scripture passages are, a kind of a little sermon, kind of a devotion, asks questions at the end for those of us who will be grappling with these scripture passages, asks some questions for us to think about. But she says some really neat things and really informed what I was thinking about today. One of the things she said is, and we are in this category as well as she, we know the seasons when one funeral has just ended and another one is upon us. We know the seasons when we start attending more memorial services than weddings. We know the seasons when newscasters report the same story of death and destruction day after day, the only difference being the names of the victims. Death hems us in before and behind and even around the table with close friends. We can't escape it. Paul calls us to weep with those who weep as well as to be happy with those who are happy, as Nancy read. Rejoice with those who rejoice is another translation. And sometimes funerals are both of those things together. This story has death all around it. Lazarus was dead, now he's alive. But what's going to happen? Jesus is talking about his death and his burial, and Mary is anointing him with this precious perfume as if he were dead already. That was another neat idea, this person. Jill Duffield's her name. She said, Mary knows she can't waste a lot of time preparing Jesus for his burial because he's not going to be dead for long, right? Three days in the tomb, he's going to rise again. And she may have understood that better than some of the disciples, but she doesn't waste any time. Well, at this reception that I went to on Wednesday, after people have asked me how the funeral service was for my friend Dwight. Like I said, 54 years old with a 15-year-old son. And I've decided this is how it was. It was a great funeral. And sometimes funerals are great, always sad, and sometimes great as well. And there was a lot of crying, and there was a lot of laughing as well. But one of the things that uh, Dwight's widow, Margaret, a friend of ours as well, uh, wrote about and shared with a bunch of us the day after um, about the funeral This is, is again, this strange mixture of weeping and rejoicing. Sometimes we do both at the same time. She said, one of the pleasures of that day, that Wednesday, if I can put it that way, one of the pleasures of the day of the funeral was the presence of a group of friends from our days at Duke and Blacknell. That's the church that Wendy and I went to in college and after. Some of whom now live elsewhere, Tennessee, Michigan, Pennsylvania, that's us, New Hampshire, who had traveled to be present at the funeral. Of course, there were many more friends who were not able to make the trip, but the ones who were there seemed in some real way to represent those who couldn't come, surrounding those in need and in grief with encouragement and comfort. And that's what she said. I felt surrounded by these old friends who had come to mourn Dwight's loss with me. Paul says that we are to comfort one another in our sorrows with the comfort that God has given us. We are comforted when we grieve so that we can comfort others when they grieve. And then after the funeral, Margaret went home and she discovered a large box on the doorstep. And she says, it was filled with packing peanuts, something wrapped in layers and layers of bubble wrap, which turned out to contain a piece of art glass, a slightly curved square dish, partly glazed in green, partly clear, with lots of little bubbles in it. The sort of thing you could put fruit on, but that you might be more likely just to display because it is so beautiful. And with it was a card. It was from another half dozen friends, three couples from Durham, North Carolina, People I had known before my marriage to Dwight. Oh, I thought, this is from my old friends. How lovely. 
And then I remembered, these were Dwight's old friends too. In fact, they were older friends of his than they were of mine. As he had moved to Durham two years before I had, it was such a touching reminder of how his world and mine had come together when we married, and we had discovered that his friends were my friends, and vice versa. And this is in the context of a longer story she told about how they met, uh, the few times that they met but never got to know each other. And one time they were in a gathering together and both came away from that gathering convinced they didn't want to know each other any better than they already did, had zero interest in getting to know each other. And a few years later they fall in love and they get married and they were married for about 20 years. We surround one another in time of grief. We encourage one another and we comfort one another with the same comfort that God has given us in time of loss. And we did that on a Wednesday afternoon. And there were a lot of people at this service. And there were a lot of people that I thought might be there that weren't there. And that's just the nature of things, right? I mean, for a lot of folks, it would have been a long drive. It was the middle of a work day in the middle of the afternoon. But things have changed recently and you may not have paid attention to it. Um, I've talked with a lot of funeral directors, even in the last couple of years, about this change. It once was that when somebody died and there was a funeral, everything stopped. Everything stopped. If you were connected to that person at all, you were going to the service. If you were a family member, absolutely everything stopped. And that is not so much the case anymore. It's sometimes harder to weep with those who weep, to mourn with those who mourn, because we're not there for them A very interesting trend is that more and more services are held on a Saturday. We wait until Saturday because the thought is people will be more available on Saturdays. The reality is that the attendance is not necessarily better on Saturday than any other day. I'm not sure what to make of this. I'm actually a little bit worried about this. Families think, oh, people are so busy and they're working, but on Saturday they'll be able to. And uh, one of the funeral directors I've talked with said, yes, people think Saturday's the free day. And instead the family goes, oh, we've got all these things going on and we're just not going to be able to make it to the funeral. Family members of the deceased, that happens. It also used to be the case that when there was a funeral in a church, most of the church would show up for either the visitation or for the funeral. Oftentimes both. And I think you do a good job at visitations. Um, And I know that there are a lot of realities, and I want to say this as gently as I can. So let me put it this way. Let me remind you that once upon a time, it was expected that when a member of the church died, the church was there to send them off, to remember them, to encourage and comfort the family. And that's happening less and less, and it's not just us. It's happening everywhere. But just in case it slipped your mind, it used to be a stop-everything moment. And that wouldn't hurt to get back to something like that. There are seasons in life and seasons in societies when death and dying is weighing on people's minds all the time. In our country, one of the worst times for this, of course, was during the American Civil War. And there was an historian whose name I knew, but the book I did not know, who wrote wrote about this in a book called The Republic of Suffering, Death in the American Civil War. She writes that more than 2% of the nation's inhabitants died as a direct result of the war. More than 2% of everybody in our country died as a direct result of the Civil War. And people find themselves in a new universe. Everything is different now. It's new morally, it's new uh, societally, it's new relationally. Unimaginable destruction had become daily experience. And then questions were asked 150 years ago that were asked... 15 years ago, and are asked today, where did God belong in such a world? How could a benevolent deity countenance such cruelty and such suffering? Doubt seemed to overpower faith. Faith in the Christian narrative of a compassionate God and a hope of life beyond the grave. Faith that the world makes sense and life makes sense on this earth. And language seemed powerless to explain Humans unable to comprehend what their deaths and thus their lives could mean. When we weep with those who weep and we hope to rejoice with those who rejoice, we do have to come to grips with this reality. Life seems different than we expected it to be. And there is way too much death and dying uh, that we are having to deal with day to day. But yet, at this strange dinner party... Jesus reclining at the table with his friends and his disciples, reclining alongside Lazarus, 
the man of the house, the host who had invited Jesus to be the guest of honor. And so on the one hand, death is all around it. She's reserved this for the time of my burial. You will not always have me with you. Lazarus is right there. And yet there's something else present. And it's the power of resurrection. Resurrection is looming over this dinner party just as surely, maybe more surely and certainly than death is. This is Jill Duffield again. Death hems us in behind and before, but resurrection breaks its barriers and ascends to the very right hand of God in heaven. This is a great idea. Death is pervasive. It seems to be everywhere. Resurrection is invasive and it's breaking in and it's going to conquer. God is death defying and always has the last word. We're pretty good at rejoicing with those who rejoice. Rarely are we covetous of other people's achievements or other people's grandkids' achievements or whatever. Um, I was reading just the most pitiful... I don't know why I read this article. The co- it's the advice column in the newspaper. I don't know why. I don't, I'm always disappointed. And yet... Oh, you know why? It's right below the crossword puzzle. And I'm getting to the crossword puzzle. And then, well, what do we have today? What do we have today is a bunch of nonsense, really. Um, absolute nonsense. But this, it was terrible. And, and you're asking these two strangers that you don't know, what should I do? Well, what should I do when I gather with my siblings? And one of my siblings is always bragging on his life and his kid's life and how great everything is. And when you try to say, hey, things are going okay for us too, he just interrupts you and goes on to how great his life is compared to yours. And whatever should I do? Well, I have a lot of things I'd suggest about what you do. You have to come make an appointment with, with me if you want to know what you do. In my old age, I have started to say things that 20 years ago I would not, thought, I would not have thought I would say. Okay, here's, a, here's just a freebie. I have been known to tell people in this room, you're not required to be in a relationship with people who are always soul-killing. You don't have to be in a relationship with people whose whole purpose seems to be to make you feel small and cut you out or cut you down and make you feel terrible. You're not required to be. If you stay around long enough, I do say you are required to love them, but loving them doesn't necessarily mean having them over to dinner so they can tell you how great everything else is and how lousy all your stuff is. Should not read it. But we can rejoice with those who rejoice in lots of areas. And we should rejoice over achievements of small and large proportions. There are all kinds of ways in which people do great things or their grandkids do great things. I love to see clippings on the bulletin board. I like it when it's my kids. I really enjoy it when it's other people's grandkids and kids as well. That's wonderful. But we do a lot better than that. We can rejoice in the gifts God has given to us. In the first service, one of the first things that that was said to the people right out of the gates was... Thank you for being here after the hard work that we did last night. Thank you for that reminder, Gene, because a lot of you pulled a lot of weight last night. And we opened our doors to our community. And a lot of you came in and enjoyed the dinner, which is just as good. And retirees luncheon is Friday. And it seems like there was something else that we just did. And it's a busy time, but we have gifts that we can use to give to others, to bless others. And we can rejoice in that. Rejoice in the work we did together. Rejoice when gifts are given to us, when blessings are poured out upon us as well. Maybe it's too easy, and so I don't want to dwell too much on it. Rejoicing with those who rejoice, if it is really hard for us to rejoice with others who are doing well, that's usually not that person's problem. It has something to do with us, and God is happy to work on that with you and with me when we are jealous or when we are not delighted in other people's reasons for rejoicing. But Paul, in that passage that Nancy read, he's telling us about how to be the community together, how to be the body of Christ. And of course, this is supposed to fit into this whole series on I belong. I belong to God. I belong to Jesus Christ. I belong to the body of Christ. I belong to other sisters and brothers in Christ in this room and around the world. We belong to each other. And part of that belonging is sharing. And part of that sharing is sharing in grief and sharing in joy. When others are rejoicing, when others are blessed, we get to and should rejoice along with them and be blessed along with them. The way one person put it is seeing this whole story of death and resurrection kind of at battle in this dinner party. Everything seems to be about death, but resurrection is coming. Mary knows it. Better anoint him quickly because in a few days he's going to go to the, to the cross. And a couple of days after that, he's going to be alive again. So in the meantime, what do we do in the meantime? Serve Jesus, 
love Jesus, listen to Jesus, gather around the table with Jesus and with one another, no matter what is past, no matter what is yet to come. Part of the rejoicing with those who rejoice as well as weeping with those who weep does happen in the midst of loss when somebody dear to us has gone to be with Almighty God and our Savior Jesus Christ. But we are called to love one another in the midst of it all. Or as Duffield says, she says, we are called to unabashedly love and serve those. This is an interesting phrase. Unabashedly love and serve those fresh from the grave and those soon to go to it, both of which we see at this strange dinner party. In good church fashion, make the casserole, bake the bread, take them to those who need to be sustained in the midst of grief. We do a good job of that. Don't save the best for later. Use it now on the ones who may not have a tomorrow. That's a challenging word in this day and age. Forget about hoarding money in the purse. Share it with the poor, because in the poor you can see Jesus too. Whatever you do to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you do it unto me. Serve willingly, love extravagantly because you have listened attentively and you know that while death is everywhere, resurrection comes out of nowhere because our God is death defying and he always has the final word and that word is good news. Weeping with those who weep, we see sadness around us all the time. That should be relatively easy, relatively natural. My friend Dwight was great about that. As somebody who was in a wheelchair from the time he was 19 years old until he couldn't get out of bed any longer, he had an incredible way of seeing people hurting, seeing people struggling, and being able to ask the most personal questions without offending. Amazingly, he could get to the heart of matters so quickly. When he saw somebody in need, his natural reaction was to reach out pastorally and lovingly. Weeping with those who weep ought to come more or less naturally. Rejoicing with those who rejoice may take a little more work. But what do we have to rejoice in? We have to rejoice in the fact that even in the midst of death, resurrection is breaking in. God has power over death. Christ has conquered sin and death. And the final word is God's. And that final word is good news in Jesus Christ. Will you please join me in prayer? O oh God, our Father, come to us in the midst of our need, whether we are grieving or whether we are struggling to be happy for those who are happy, whether we're somewhere in between or all together at the same time. Help us to be your people, for we belong to you. And you, not because of us, belong to us because you have claimed us as your own. Lord, help us to live and love as your people in this world. We ask through Christ our Lord. Amen.